begin by thanking you all so much for coming um, today and uh, thank Rima for her great comments and Dominic for chairing. Um, so my talk actually begins in a very similar way to your talk. Um, and I want to also think about the question, what should we believe? So when we think about this question, we usually think about things that are epistemic in nature, things that would contribute to the truth of your belief, like evidence. But recently, some have sort of challenged this kind of epistemic orthodoxy and suggested that what we should believe doesn't just depend on epistemic things, but also depends on practical factors, like how bad it would be if we were wrong. And this phenomena is commonly known as pragmatic encroachment. Pragmatic encroachment is motivated in the following way. So sometimes a belief seems perfectly fine when the stakes are low. I believe this sandwich is made with almond butter. Maybe my roommate almost always makes almond butter sandwiches. And I give it to you when you come over and ask me for a snack. But change only the stakes, and now it seems like I should give up the belief. Let's say I find out you're deathly allergic to peanuts. And I know, you know my roommate almost always makes almond butter sandwiches, but there's a chance she might have made a peanut butter sandwich. Then it seems like I should no longer believe it's made with almond butter, even though my evidence hasn't changed because of how high the stakes are with respect to that. So that's the sort of, those cases like that are ones that motivate pragmatic encroachment. But on the other hand, there is something kind of odd about pragmatic encroachment. Like, can stakes alone really affect the epistemic rationality of belief in this way without a change in evidence or a change in any other factor that's related to the truth of your belief? And so what I want to do in this talk is I want to offer a way out for those who sort of share my skepticism of pragmatic encroachment. And what I want to argue today is that this view called belief credence dualism can offer a unique and powerful explanation of pragmatic encroachment cases. And belief credence dualism is basically the view that belief and credence are distinct, equally fundamental mental states, and each has a unique role to play. So first what I want to do is give a little bit of background on the pragmatic encroachment debate and talk a little bit more about some of the cases that generally motivate pragmatic encroachment. And then I'm going to move to talking about belief and credence, explaining those two attitudes and a couple views on their relationship. And then I'm going to sort of hone in on this view that I'm calling belief credence dualism and talk about a particular motivation for dualism. And then after I talk about that motivation, I'm going to argue that dualism, and especially those who buy this motivation for dualism, um, have access to a unique and powerful explanation for what's going on in these cases that are usually used to motivate pragmatic encroachment. And then I'm going to argue that this explanation is at least largely unique to dualism when compared to um, other views about the relationship between belief and credence. And then um, finally, I'm going to address how my view interacts with a phenomenon that's closely related to pragmatic encroachment, uh, moral encroachment. And I'm lucky to have a commenter that's like an expert on that. So I'm excited for that. <laughs> I said, yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, let's jump into section two pragmatic encroachment. So I want to begin this section by thinking about a concept that's pretty important in epistemology. And that's the concept of epistemic justification. And if you hang out with epistemologists, you might hear this term thrown around a lot, but it's actually pretty hard to define in an ecumenical way. Um, it's hard to define in a way that's you know, going to make everyone happy. So I'm going to offer this definition. I think most people are at least on board with the idea that epistemic justification helps us distinguish between two kinds of true beliefs. True beliefs that are just lucky guesses and true beliefs that are candidates for knowledge. And um, so, so what the, the, the type of pragmatic encroachment that I want to focus on in this talk today is pragmatic encroachment on epistemic justification. And basically what that view says is what is justified or rational, and I'm just going to use justified and rational kind of interchangeably. Um, in this, oh, so in this talk, I'm just gonna, I hope that's just, that's not a substantive point, that's just a terminological thing, but yeah. So it says what is justified or rational for us to believe depends not only on evidence or other epistemic factors, but also on what is at stake for the believer. So a lot of people who initially thought about epistemic justification were talking about whether the practical encroached on knowledge, whether practical stakes could affect what we know. And I'm happy to talk about knowledge in Q&A if you're interested in that. But one thought is, well, maybe the practical encroaches on knowledge by encroaching on epistemic justification. Um, and you might also just be intrinsically interested on whether the practical encroaches on epistemic justification. So I'm just going to kind of set knowledge aside for this talk 
Um, again, we can talk about the Q&A and focus on epistemic justification. Okay, so pragmatic encroachment is traditionally motiv motivated by cases like the van cases. And these might be familiar to a lot of you, but I'm just gonna go over them to make sure we're all on the same page. So low stakes version of the case. Hannah is driving home on a Friday afternoon and plans to stop by the bank to deposit a check. There's no urgency to deposit this check. And Hannah drives by the bank and notices that the lines are extremely long. She remembers that she was at the bank a few weeks ago on a Saturday and thus justifiably believes that the bank is open tomorrow. Okay, seems like a normal everyday case. Nothing really fishy going on, but consider this case. Hi, Hannah is also driving home on a Friday afternoon and plans to stop by the bank to deposit a check. She again sees very long lines. However, she has very little money in her account and her mortgage payment is due Monday. She doesn't get the check deposited by that weekend. She will default on her mortgage and go bankrupt. She again has the same evidence. She has this memory of being at the bank a few weeks ago on a Saturday, but she also knows her memory is fallible and banks do change their hours. And so the thought is, well look, Hannah's evidence, Hannah's epistemic situation is the same in both the low stakes version of this case and the high stakes version of this case. But if we just vary the practical factors, um, it seems like we get a different intuition about what Hannah should believe. So pairs of cases like these are often used to motivate pragmatic encroachment. However, there are some people that nonetheless stand their ground. <laughs> um, and these are people I'm calling purists, and they basically deny pragmatic encroachment occurs. And they say, look, this is like a huge shift in the way epistemologists have generally thought about epistemic justification. And it seems really weird that just changing the stakes without changing anything about your epistemic situation can affect what you're epistemically justified in believing. Um, remember, Hannah's evidence is the exact same in both cases. Um, so, I think, yeah, I like this view. Rima's gonna talk about whether this is like, <laughs> How much, of it, how much of this should be a default view, and, and so that'll come up a little bit. But, but for those of you who kind of feel like, yeah, there is something going for purism, like there is something really intuitive about this, there's something really weird about pragmatic encroachment, um, I wanna appeal to you guys and say, we do have this good reason to, to try to keep the epistemic pure. But at the same time, we need an explanation for what's going on in cases like the bank cases, the almond butter case, similar examples. The purist, this is kind of a problem for purism. So what I want to do in this talk is I want to argue that belief credence dualism can provide such an explanation. Okay, so that's like a little bit about pragmatic encroachment. Now let's move on to section three, belief credence dualism. Okay, so belief, it's a very familiar attitude. It's the attitude of taking something to be the case or regarding it as true. And most people who think about belief I think there are primarily three belief-like attitudes we can take towards a proposition we've considered. We can believe it, we can withhold on it, and we can disbelieve it. And in this sense, belief is a coarse-grained attitude. So you know, maybe I believe it will snow tomorrow, I'm pretty sure snow is on the forecast. Um, I withhold belief that this coin will head, so there's an even number of stars. And I disbelieve that the Cavs will win the 2019 NBA Finals, because they lost the bronze, so. <laughs> um, but one thing to note about belief is that we're more confident in some of our beliefs than in others. So you know, I believe that one plus one equals two, I believe it's gonna snow tomorrow, but I'm a lot more confident that one plus one equals two and that it will snow tomorrow. <coughs> so for this reason, epistemologists appeal to another attitude that's um, similar to a level of confidence that I'm just gonna call credence today. And basically what a credence is, is it's one's confidence level or kind of the subjective probability um, that something is true. And credences are often measured on a scale from zero to one, where zero sort of represents maximal confidence something's false, one represents maximal confidence something's true. So, you know, I might have a 0.9 credence that will snow tomorrow if the forecast predicts a 90% chance of snow. I might have a 0.5 credence that this coin will win heads. But credences, um, in contrast with belief, are much more fine grained. So there's a lot more credences we can take towards the proposition than belief like attitudes. Um, but one thing in this talk, um, I'm not gonna assume that credences always have to be numerical, right? So I might have a really low credence that the Cavs will win the 2019 NBA Finals, even if there's not like a precise number that represents my credence. Okay, so we have beliefs, we have credences. This raises the question, how do beliefs and credences relate to each other? What's their relationship? And there's three main views on this question. So the first is what I call a belief first view. And on this view, beliefs are the more fundamental attitude and credences are a species of belief. So 
my 0.9 credence, it will snow tomorrow. It's just a belief with the content. The probability it will snow tomorrow is 0.9. Okay, I'm just gonna set that view aside for now. We can definitely talk more about in Q&A, talk about reasons I reject it, but I'm just gonna set it aside. The view that I wanna focus on today is what's called the credence first view. And on the credence first view, credences are more fundamental and beliefs are a species of credence. So on many versions of the credence first view, Beliefs are credences above some threshold. Um, some people have the view that belief is credence one, but I sort of think that view is implausible, especially if we think we're more confident in some of our beliefs than in others. We can talk more about reasons I reject the belief as credence one view in Q&A if you want. Um, but let's just say, for the sake of argument, one is a little high, you know, 0.5 seems a little low. So here's a toy version of the credence first view. You believe everything, you have at least a 0.75 credence in. We can just throw the threshold right in the middle. You know, that's just, that's a version of the view. There's different versions, some have moving thresholds. Um, but on this view, what it is to believe is just to have a credence above some threshold. And then the third view about the relationship to, between belief and credence is dualism. And this view says that neither belief nor credence reduces to the other, but they're both equally fundamental. They both have important roles to play. <coughs> okay, here is a motivation for dualism. Reasoning, especially practical reasoning, reasoning about what to do, has at least two aims, accuracy and efficiency. So when deciding what to do, we want our attitudes to be accurate. We want them to accurately represent our evidential situation. But sometimes we have to make a decision quickly or the stakes are really low and we just don't need perfect accuracy, especially because perfect accuracy can require a lot more cognitive effort. And this idea that reasoning has these two aims is supported by the adaptive toolbox model in psychology. Basically what this model says is that there's multiple methods that we use to form judgments and make decisions. And which method we use it depends on the situation, but one of our primary goals is to pick a tool that's maximally efficient, but accurate enough for our circumstances. <clears throat> and so what I want to propose is that belief and credence are two cognitive tools that help us balance efficiency and accuracy of reasoning. And here's how. So when we rely on our belief that P, we exclude or never consider the possibility of not P. And this is a more efficient way to reason. There's less possibilities that you have to take into account when making your decision. I'm driving my car, I see the light turn green, I believe it's green and I go through. And I never consider the possibility that maybe I was just struck with color blindness or you know, whatever. I don't do that, I just believe P and act on P. And that's what it looks like to rely on P and reasoning. And this makes reasoning simpler than always have to, having to consider um, the, the possibility of error. However, there's another way to reason. You can also reason using your credence <coughs> in P. And when you reason using your credence in P, you're gonna be considering both P and not P. So oftentimes, this is a more accurate representation of your evidential situation. Um, but it's gonna require more cognitive effort. There's more possibilities that you're gonna have to take into consideration when deciding what to do. So this is a little <laughs> uh, abstract. I'm gonna give you guys some examples of what I think this looks like. So let's go back to the case we talked about at the beginning of the talk with the almond butter sandwich. So the thought is this, when you come over and you don't have any allergies and you're like, hey, do you have any food? I just believe there's an almond butter sandwich in the fridge. I never consider the possibility I'm wrong and I'd give it to you on that basis. But when you come over and you have this deathly, you're deathly allergic to peanuts and you would like go to the hospital and they should die if you eat peanuts, then what I'm doing is I'm not just gonna rely on my belief that the sandwich is made with almond butter and give it to you. Instead, I'm gonna kind of bring my belief tool in and bring out my credence tool. And instead I'm gonna rely on my credence, which makes me consider both the possibility of P and the possibility of not P. And because I'm considering the possibility of not P, then we can like represent using decision theory why I should either gather more evidence or give you another snack because of how bad it would be if I was wrong about the almond butter sandwich. Um, here's a second example inspired by Keith DeRose, uh, uh, inspired by an example from Keith DeRose. So I have an office mate and her name's Rachel. And let's say I come to the office one morning, I see Rachel's coat and backpack. And then my friend Sam is like, hey Liz, is Rachel in the office today? And I'm like, yep, I saw her coat and backpack. I think that's a totally normal scenario. I think we do stuff like that all the time. I believe Rachel's in today and I rely on that belief in telling Sam what to do. Or in, 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 sorry, in telling Sam um, whether Rachel's in today and answering Sam's question. Okay, let's say instead, I really hope this never happens because this would be horrible, 
But let's say there's a murder at the Notre Dame philosophy department. And the police come in and they are making their list of suspects. And they need a list of every single person who was in the department that day. Then it no longer seems appropriate to, for me to respond in the same way I responded to Sam. I don't just say, yep, Rachel was in today. Instead I say, well, you know, I have some good evidence Rachel was in today. It's likely Rachel was in today, but there's definitely a chance I'm wrong about that. And what I'm doing is because the stakes are so much higher, I'm sort of pulling in my belief tool and reasoning using my credence tool and deciding what to tell the police. And that bit of reasoning is more complex because I'm um, having to consider extra possibilities and what to tell the police, but the bump in accuracy is worth it, given what's at stake. Okay, here's an analogy I like to use to sort of illustrate this trade-off between um, accuracy and efficiency. So let's say we're painting a wall. Um, a lot of times, when we paint a wall, we don't just use one brush. We use both a roller brush and a detail brush. You use the roller brush to sort of paint the big flat surfaces of the wall where mistakes are unlikely and you sort of just want to efficiently get paint on there um, as quickly as possible. But if we're painting the corners or around the door or those kinds of things, you're not just going to like roll over with the roller brush. No, you're going to switch to a detail brush and that's going to enable you to more accurately get paint where it needs to go and not make the mistake of like getting paint everywhere. So of course you could paint the whole wall with a roller brush, but <laughs> it'd be pretty sloppy and um, not accurate in certain places. You could also paint the whole wall with a detail brush, but that would like take forever and be painfully inefficient. So there is some sense in which when we're painting, we kind of have these dual goals of accuracy and efficiency, but I think this is often what's going on in cases of practical reasoning as well. And I think beliefs are like the roller brush and that they're used um, in cases where um, efficiency is, is more important and the cost of error isn't as high. But then sometimes when the stakes are a lot higher, we'll pull in our belief tool and start using our credence tool where more accuracy is needed. Okay, so hopefully that view can kind of help you guys see the, the way I think belief and credence are sort of two cognitive tools that help us balance efficiency and accuracy and reasoning. Okay, so I said my main opponent is this credence first view. And what I want to argue now is that a credence first view cannot maintain the same simplifying role of belief. And here's why. If belief is just a high credence, this doesn't allow the believer to exclude possibilities in a way that would simplify reasoning. Um, Jonathan Weisberg has a nice paper where he basically argues, look, on a credence first view, the reasoning process going on here is just going to be a lot more complex. In virtue of having a high credence in P, both possibilities will at least at some point need to be live for you. So what you would do is you would form a credence, you'd be considering both possibilities, you'd compare your credence to whatever the threshold for belief is, and then you'd discard the possibility of not P if your credence kind of met that threshold. But this requires a way more complex calculation than an agent who just treats P as given, never considering the possibility of not P. You know, like when I see the red light and I just believe, it, or sorry, the green light. I don't run red, red, red lights, I promise. <laughs> well, okay, that's a lie. I'm gonna do something. But, Let's say I'm being good, <laughs> I see the green light. Um, I just believe it's green and I just go on that basis and I don't form a credence, compare that credence to some threshold then rule out the possibility of error. Um, and it's also interesting, some of the psychological evidence, um, ruling out a possibility in your decision making is actually really cognitively costly, like surprisingly cognitively costly. Um, and so requiring these kind of extra steps that the credence first view requires these are the exact kind of computational steps that beliefs are supposed to minimize. So I just, I, I don't see how a credence first view is gonna be able to um, maintain the simplifying rule of belief. Um, at least it's gonna, they can try, but I think dualism is gonna have a much better story here. So it's also just unclear in which sense belief and credence are two cognitive tools given the credence first view. The view that I kind of argued for using the paintbrush analogy. There's only one type of tool, there's credences, <coughs> and then a subset of those tools are also beliefs. So you might push back and you might say, well, no, 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 like, there's these credences above this threshold, and those credences, they function like beliefs. They're stable, they let you, you know, exclude possibilities in the way beliefs do, that kind of thing. But then what you're basically saying is, well, look, there's a state, the state functions differently than most of our other credences, and it functions just how we thought beliefs function. And at a certain point, I think you've kind of just given away the game. I think you're basically a dualist. Um, and so you could back off and you could say, well, no, 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 all we really have is high credences, but then I'm gonna say, I don't, I don't think you can get the simplifying role of belief anymore. 
Um, I don't know how I don't know how you're going to account for these extra properties of belief, like stability um, and the, the ability to simplify reasoning. Okay, so I hope I haven't gone way over with that. Oh my gosh! Oh shoot! Okay, I'm just going to go really fast. Okay, so here's this motivation for dualism. Um, let's go back to thinking about the bank cases. So in the bank cases, proponents of pragmatic encroachment endorse the idea that when the stakes are low, given her epistemic situation, Hannah can believe P, but when the stakes are high, Hannah can't believe P. So what I want to argue is that that's not actually what's going on in the bank cases. Instead, I want to argue this. When the stakes are low, given her epistemic situation, it's rational for Hannah to both believe P and to rely on her belief that P in reasoning. So it's rational for Hannah to treat P as true in her reasoning. But when the stakes are high, given her epistemic situation, it's rational for Hannah to believe P, but it's not rational for Hannah to rely on her belief that P. Instead, she should rely on her credence that P. So she shouldn't treat P as given, she should consider both P and not P. Okay, here's a huge question this raises. Sorry, I'm kind of like going really fast, but what is the difference between having a belief and relying on it in reasoning? Can we even make sense of that distinction? If you're not relying on a belief, how can we even make sense of the idea that you even have the belief? Okay, I'm going to give two quick examples where I think this is exactly what's going on. Okay, this um, is from Brown. So Liz, not me, different Liz, is offered a bet <laughs> on whether she was born in England. Liz was in fact born there, and she has excellent, excellent reasons for believing this. Her parents told her, her family tells stories about visiting her in the hospital, she has it on her birth certificate, whatever. But the payoffs of the bet are as follows. If Liz was born in England, she gets $10, and if she wasn't, she's tortured for the next 30 years. Liz decides not to take the bet. Sorry, it's a little morbid. Um, one more example. So John rationally believes on excellent evidence that his friend's wife is cheating on her husband. The husband confronts John because John has had this evidence for weeks and he's upset that John didn't tell him sooner. John admits he's believed this and he's had quite a bit of evidence that she was cheating for a while, but he didn't want to say anything until he was absolutely sure because he knew the damage it would cause to their marriage. I have some more cases we can talk about in Q&A, but I'm trying to go quickly. So, in these cases, Liz and John, I think they have a justified belief in the relevant proposition throughout the case. But nonetheless, because of the stakes, they shouldn't rely on their beliefs and reasoning. Instead, they should rely on their credences. And we can even imagine people in, in these cases saying something like, well, yeah, I believe it, but because things would be so bad if I were wrong, I'm not going to act on it. I'm not going to take the bet, or I'm not going to tell my friend his wife is cheating, that kind of thing. So what I'm sort of suggesting here is a bit of an error theory for our pragmatic encroachment intuitions. I don't think we're clearly distinguishing between when we ought to rationally have a belief and we, when we ought to rationally rely on a belief in reasoning. So I don't think Hannah has to give up her belief the bank is open tomorrow. I think her situation is just one that she shouldn't rely on this belief when deciding what to do given what's at stake. So on my view, rationally having a belief or having a credence is not stake sensitive. That's purely a function of your evidence or your epistemic situation or whatever. You fill in your favorite theory of epistemic justification. But rationally relying on a belief or relying on a credence is stake sensitive. So that's going to be affected by practical factors, which tool we should rely on in reasoning. OK. I'm going to take like one more minute and talk about moral encroachment because <laughs> Rima's comments talk a lot about that. So here's a challenge for my view. That's the challenge for moral encroachment. And moral encroachment says what's epistemically justified or rational for us to believe depends not only on evidence or epistemic factors, but also on moral factors. So suppose I have quite a bit of evidence, maybe it's misleading evidence, for a belief that's sexist or racist. Proponents of moral encroachment maintain that despite my evidential situation, uh, the fact that believing this is morally wrong, that gives me an epistemic reason not to believe it. And this contrasts with the view I've defended above because uh, the view I've defended above says, epistemically, um, it's fine to have the belief, but you just shouldn't rely on it in reasoning. So this seems to pose a special challenge, because there is seem like there's something really bad about having this racist belief, even if you don't act on it or rely on it in reasoning. OK, so I agree that it's problematic to hold the offensive belief, but I think that moral encroachment doesn't properly locate the source of the problem. I think that the problem in this case is not epistemic, because you believed in accord with your evidence. But the problem is, is moral and all things considered. So I think you morally ought not have the belief, and you all things considered not, ought not have the belief. But from a purely epistemic point of view, you've done what you should do. And I also think, 
I have a view about the way that epistemic and moral oughts combine to form all things considered oughts, and I think that in almost all cases, the moral is gonna override the epistemic. So let's say there's an evil demon who captures your family and will only let them go if you take a pill that gives you a false belief. <laughs> I think you should clearly take the pill even though it's epistemically bad because of uh, the moral stakes involved. So I think given this view of the way that epistemic and moral oughts combine, um, we can get a plausible result. Epistemically rational but morally offensive beliefs are epistemically justified, but nonetheless morally and all things considered problematic. Thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm going to skip over some of my summarizing of yeah. Liz's paper, uh, given that the main spirit of my questions is to ask Liz to tell us a bit more about some of the stuff that she had to gloss over, given the time constraints that we have here. Uh, and so the handout that's going around has more of the summarizing that's done. I'm just going to give you the bare bones of what's on the handout. And so just about the direct argument, like I should say I'm fairly sympathetic, like quite sympathetic to believe creative dualism. And I really like the analogy of painting. But I have a question about like, what exactly the unique role of belief is as opposed to the unique role of credence. Because my understanding of Liz's account, and I'm sure she'll correct me if I get this wrong, is that the function of beliefs is just to accurately represent the world as it is, whereas the function of credences, it, or reliance on credences, is to represent the world in a manner that's more sensitive to the consequences of relying on the beliefs that one holds. And so reliance on credences then can fluctuate based on what's needed in like, one's epistemic situation. But this like, demarcation of the unique role for belief and the unique role of credence is the complete flip of a traditional like, demarcation between the two attitudes. Because according to like, Laura Buchat, the reason that we need both beliefs and credences is because our practices of holding each other accountable and responsible are governed by beliefs, not credences. And it's our beliefs that we're answerable not our credences, whereas on Jackson's account that she's provided so far, it's actually our credences that we're answerable for, not our beliefs. And so I thought that was interesting and I want to hear more about how that works, because I'm certainly on the beliefs seem more closely tied to responsibility than mm. uh, credences side. Uh, and so the second argument that Jackson offers is this indirect argument. This is the argument that a positive feature of belief credence dualism is that it can explain away pragmatic encroachment and the motivations behind it, and as Liz already signaled, like, how odd is pragmatic encroachment really? I'm coming from the other side from Liz, where it's like pragmatic encroachment actually seems to have a lot going for it, whereas the opposite view, I just find it really hard to get into headspace of. Because, uh, I wanted to skip that bit. So, uh, Part of the appeal of pragmatic encroachment is how it can make sense of all these everyday cases that according to traditional accounts in epistemology shouldn't make sense. Cases in which our threshold for justification seems shifty. Like maybe it's traditional epistemology with its uh, overly simplistic insistence that there, can be, that there can't be any change in justification without a change in the evidential status of the belief. Maybe they got it wrong. Because we can think about the different standards we have for determining guilt in a criminal court, in a civil court, on the playground. Think about our beliefs about the distant past. I can easily believe things about Cleopatra, the sack of Rome, and Genghis Khan. And I'm justified in believing those things, even though evidence in any other context, like beliefs about the recent past, would be insufficient to justify believing. And the pragmatic encroacher's point is that all sorts of stuff other than evidence seems relevant to the question of what we should believe. And so it shouldn't be that odd or surprising that what an agent or believe can change without an accompanying change in the evidence she has for her belief. And I don't think Liz and I are just arguing about intuitions here. Rather, it comes down to this kind of methodological standpoint. Mm. Like, should we hold on to our traditional theoretical commitments and try to explain away all the data that my approaches are trying to explain? Or maybe we should throw out those theoretical commitments and start again with that data as our starting point. And so maybe it's not a positive for dualism that it can explain away pragmatic encroachment. Maybe a better one would be one that was consistent with pragmatic encroachment. Uh, and so just to say a bit more about that. And then finally, the challenge for moral encroachment. Uh, so the challenge is that certain beliefs are morally risky, for example, racist beliefs, such that even if an agent has a lot of evidence for that belief, Given the high moral stakes, she shouldn't believe the racist belief. And so whereas Liz can tell us why someone shouldn't rely on a belief in a high stakes case, 
in a morally high stakes case, like not relying isn't enough. You also shouldn't believe in the high stakes, in the morally high stakes case. And so Liz's response is that moral encroachment fails to properly locate the source of the problem because the problem, she argues, is not epistemic because the agent is believing in accordance with the evidence. But that response, like, in a sense, like, begs the question against the moral encroacher and that the point that the moral encroacher is trying to make is that that agent is in fact not believing in accordance with the evidence, that there is both a moral and an epistemic mistake in those cases. So if we take like the traditional evil demon case that Liz considers, like a demon will kill your family unless you take a false belief inducing pill, you get this straightforward conflict between the moral or in the epistemic or. But the cases that motivate moral encroachment aren't quite like those cases. Uh, Jamie's smiling at me because he's <laughs> working on a paper on this right now. Uh, so, Moral encroachment often starts from the observation that the evidence that one has does not by itself settle the question of what one should believe, because there are multiple evidential policies that are consistent with the evidence that you have, and so all sorts of moral and pragmatic factors make a difference as to what evidential policy you choose. And so that's how practical and moral considerations are relevant to the epistemic question. And so on the handout, I've given just one example of moral encroachment, this kind of Jamesian moral encroachment put forward by Michael Pace, though there are several other representatives of moral encroachment in this room. But I use this example because it has a, a structural resonance with Liz's direct argument for dualism, because it again recognizes that belief has to play these two roles. You have to like, uh, believe the truth and also avoid error. And so when the costs of error are high, whether for practical or moral reasons, the threshold for justification must be higher. And when the costs of error are high because the belief risks running the subject of the belief, it's not sufficient to not just rely on the belief, you also have to refrain from believing altogether. And so the belief is bad on just epistemic grounds because the evidence you have is insufficient to justify in this case. And so nothing that I've said uh, here in defense of pragmatic encroachment or moral encroachment really bears on this question of whether or not belief credence dualism is correct. Like I think that question can be like considered independent of these other considerations. Uh, given that I do like, consider myself quite sympathetic to the dualist position, but what I remain unconvinced by is this indirect argument for belief credence dualism. Mm -hmm. And so invitation to say more. Thank you. Yeah, great. <laughs> so those are like super helpful comments and I, don't have something probably satisfactory to say about all of them, but they were really helpful. Rima sent me amazing comments way ahead in advance, so thank you so much. You're like the best commenter ever. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about a few of the things that she mentioned. Um, the first is sort of the role for belief and how does that differ the, uh, from the role for credences. And so I guess in this talk, um, what I was trying to put forth primarily was this simplified role belief that beliefs sort of simplify reasoning by letting us treat some proposition as true. Um, and then credences kind of come in when we need a more accurate representation of our evidential situation. However, I'm very open to the idea that there can be additional roles for belief as well. And Laura Bushak has a nice paper where she argues that belief actually plays a really crucial role in our practices of praise and blame, which is basically what Rima said. So in this talk, I focused on one specific role for belief, which is a simplifying role. But if uh, beliefs also play this role in our practices in praise and blame that a high credence can't play. I'm like, woohoo, more arguments against the credence first few. So I'm cool with like taking on additional roles for belief as well, but I have sort of focused on a particular simplifying role here. Um, so here's a question, how odd is pragmatic encroachment, right? Uh, and I guess like in this talk, I haven't even really given arguments against pragmatic encroachment. I've kind of been like, hey, if you're already sympathetic to purism, here's a nice kind of like explanation for the bank cases. Um, but I do want to say this, like, look, when we think about epistemic justification and kind of the work that epistemic justification is supposed to do, um, okay, like, I'm epistemically justified in believing there's a table here, right? I have good evidence of its existence. And I'm not epistemically justified in believing there's, like, an invisible unicorn in this room um, just because I like unicorns, right? Even though, like, there might be a practical benefit to that or something, right? So I think... Part of the reason that epistemic justification was kind of initially employed was to help us sort of distinguish these good beliefs, like based on evidence, based on, you know, there's a good epistemic basis, from these like bad beliefs, like the wishful thinking beliefs, right? 
So one reason you might sort of like want to be a purist is because once we start letting the practical factors in, I start to lose a grip on how epistemic justification is helping us make that distinction, right? Because if practical factors can um, affect epistemic justification, then I'm like, well, why can't I just believe there's a unicorn in this room? It would make me super happy. Like, like so, so I'm worried that like, it's muddying the waters in a way that I don't like. Maybe I'm just like begging the question for purism though. So again, like there's a lot of interesting methodological things in the background that we can't settle here. Um, and I also don't take myself to have argued against pragmatic encroachment, so I will say that. Um, another thing I do want to say though, when we say what should I believe, I actually think that question is ambiguous between what should I believe epistemically, what should I believe morally, what should I believe all things considered. And it might be that in a lot of instances when we say what should I believe, we're picking out something more like an all things considered got rather than an epistemic got. And I, I wonder if some of the intuitions behind pragmatic encroachment are due to that fact. When I want to hone in on the question of what should I believe epistemically speaking, and I mean Rima agrees with that. She thinks, no, this is like about epistemic justification, not just an all things considered thing. So that's kind of another thing to think about is there is some ambiguity in the question, what should I believe? Okay. Um, one last thing to say about moral encroachment, and this is like an area of research that's sort of new to me and I wanna like learn more about it and read more of the literature. Um, but one thing that Rima mentioned was like, in at least some cases of moral encroachment, these are cases where evidence doesn't settle the question of what you should believe. And I actually think those cases are not really the ones I was focusing, wanting to focus on in this talk, because those are cases arguably where um, you're in an epistemically permissive situation. And I actually think if your evidence leaves open what you should believe, it's probably totally fine to believe on the basis of a practical factor. Um, but I was thinking about cases where like, your evidence is like really, 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 really good, um, but there's like some really high stake. Uh, you know, I could even like, give you some crazy bet on like, whether one plus one equals two, you know what I mean? Um, and I think some pragmatic encroachers would say, upon given this bet where you get $10 if it's true and you're tortured for 30 years if it's false, you should withhold belief. And that's not a permissive case. So I, so I guess I wanted to actually sort of like same thing that Sophie said. I want to sort of set permissive cases aside because I think those might actually be more plausibly ones where practical factors could come in. Um, and focus on cases where the epistemic is really determinate. So um, I wanted to say that too. There's probably a lot more things I could say. Those are like really good comments. But I'm just going to leave it there so we have some time for Q&A. And like I write pi up on the board and 
the eleventh digit of pi is six. I don't know if that's true, but I just made that up, right? Let's say, let's just stipulate, like this has no practical import for the rest of your life. You're never going to need to act on this. You're never going to need to like rely on this, whatever. Like it still seems crazy and wrong for you to sit there and be like, nope, refuse to believe that. Like, let's say I'm your math teacher. I have really good evidence. I'm like, sure. I don't know. Let's like just fill it in so you have like so much evidence for this. Like, it still seems like there's something kind of bad, like something's going wrong, even if you'll never act on that belief at all. That said, <laughs> I will reiterate what I said at the end, which is I do think when it comes to this like purely epistemic ought, um, moral lots, practical lots, those are often going to override the epistemic ones. So in a way, there is some common ground because I think like, yeah, like what we should morally do is way more important. <laughs> Um, but I still think like, no, there's something going wrong when you're just like completely ignoring your evidence, even if there's like no practical import um, to what, like for the belief. So, That's is that case. I'm, I'm not sure your intuition about that. Okay, case. okay. <laughs> <laughs> that there's absolutely nothing at stake. Yeah. I don't have your intuition. So interesting, interesting. An intuitive clash. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> okay, two. Uh, thanks. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, really like the view. Um, this is all kind of new to me, so this is maybe sort of a clarificatory question. Yeah. But um, so for the bank case, I was sort of wondering what you thought the credence first explanation would be, because it seems like mm. there's two available options. So one thing I think is that, like, look, if I have a certain credence, let's say it's like 0.8, uh, that I believe P, and when the stakes are high, I'm just like not justified in having that credence. Mm -hmm. Another explanation might be, uh, Look, the threshold for my credence to count as a belief or to just, yeah, sorry, the threshold for my credence that my credence has to be at to count as a belief, mm -hmm. that's what's stake sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what's happening is I'm justified in having the credence I have in this case, I'm just, it, it can't get turned into a belief. And that seems like pretty sort of similar to your explanation. So. Yeah, well, okay. so. There's probably like different versions of this view. But this is a view in the literature. It's like a moving threshold view where like when the stakes are higher, the threshold for belief is a lot higher. And when the stakes are lower, the threshold for belief is much lower. So that's definitely a view people have. So a couple things. So um, the first is this would actually be a view that is that does posit pragmatic encroachment on belief, um, but not on credence, which is interesting because uh, another thing I'm interested in is just like, well, if belief and credence there's, like, there's two ways to think about a lot of these issues in terms of belief and in terms of credence, and I'm in interested in ways that we could be like, yeah, pragmatic encroacher about one attitude and not the other, so I think that's interesting. But that would definitely depart from my view, where I'm saying like, no, like I'm a purist about both belief and about credence. Um, so that's one thing to say. Another thing to say, though, is like on different versions of that view that would be purist about both, like, I'm not arguing today in this paper that purism entails dualism or that dualism entails purism. But I'm arguing that there's a very specific and what I think powerful and intuitive uh, motivation for dualism that can explain away pragmatic encroachment. And because the creeds first view can't maintain the simplifying role of belief, they can't get on board with this exact same explanation. That's not to say though that creeds first entails pragmatic encroachment or something, right? That's just to say they can't employ this specific explanation that I think has like a lot going for it. Maybe I'm biased. But, <laughs> um, but I think there are ways you can combine pragmatic uh, purism and a credence first view. So, does that help? Okay, yeah. Three. Hi, I'm three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, so I'm just a little bit worried. Thank you for the talk. Uh -huh. I'm just a little bit worried about your rhetoric that, look, when I have the kind of sexist and racist belief about someone based on their ratio or um, I, I group identity, I, at least epistemically, my belief is justified. So yeah. I'm worried about rhetoric. So you said, look, I'm only concerned with the cases where there are determined, like really, really, really determined evidence, at least epistemically, to justify the belief. But those are not the cases that we're mm. really mainly concerned about or what mm -hmm. motivate the uh, people who are supporting more encroachment thesis. Because yeah. the cases that we're dealing with is the, for instance, just the typical case of racial profiling, when, mm -hmm. I'm, when I'm believing something about a person based on some, sort of, some set of statistical evidence that yep. I'm trying to grab here. Um, statistical evidence, that would be the case where if it were not morally risky belief and if we're not shifting the threshold based on the stake, that would sufficiently justify your belief given that set of evidence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in those kind of cases where it is not epistemically very determinate, it seems yeah. like you're still trying to say that epistemically there's nothing wrong with having the kind of belief about the person. 
if yeah. that's the case that the evidence you have is justifying less risk to build you. Great. Is that, is that sort of what you're No, 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 this yeah. is a great question. So there's another move that I didn't have time to talk about here, but it's another move I, I sort of want to make in response to pragmatic encroachment. And I think this move is made, so Georgie Gardner has a paper in um, New Essays on Evidentialism or something that's called Evidentialism and Moral Encroachment. I think she makes a move similar to this too. And basically that move is to sort of alter your epistemology, right? So I actually have the view, and other people have this view too, Laura Bushek has this view, that you shouldn't form a belief on the basis of statistical evidence alone, right? And so I would actually say, no, in these cases, like there is something like probabilistically going for your belief, but that's no epistemic basis to believe it, right? So another sort of response to moral encroachment is like, oh, these like profiling cases, these cases where you have a bunch of statistical evidence that like someone's guilty or something, those are actually cases that just aren't even epistemically a basis for belief. And I mean, this does have weird consequences, right? It means that like um, our theory of justification for a belief isn't just a probabilistic one, but there's some other theory for um, what it means to have an epistemically justified belief that we'll have to go on. There's a couple of views on what that would look like in the literature. Um, some people just say like you shouldn't base a belief on statistical evidence. Martin Smith has this other view where it's like about normic support, that kind of thing. But yeah, so in response to I think at least some of the cases you're giving, I would just say, actually no, I just like think we just need to fix our epistemology there and we shouldn't believe because, for a purely epistemic reason because statistical evidence aren't the basis for belief. Does that help? <laughs> okay. Great, four. Some, I, I'm trying to be as ecumenical about the nature of belief yeah. as possible. At the same time, I do have some, some commitments. I mean, one view that might be stronger than the view you're talking about, but one view that would be inconsistent with my view is the view that belief is credence one. Because on that view, you couldn't really get the distinction between having a belief and relying on your reasoning because of everything you believe. You have credence one in, and then you, if you believe it, you'll just rely on that reasoning, right? So, and in the longer version of the paper, um, which is actually coming forthcoming in full quarterly. I submitted this like a year and a half ago, so <laughs> sorry, I normally try to not like present things that are coming forthcoming, but anyway. Um, but in the longer version of this paper, I talk about this a lot more. So part of, the, so part of what, how I wanted to motivate the idea that um, you could have a belief but still consider the possibility bare is with those cases I was talking about, which I went through extremely quickly, right? But a case where you're offered some crazy bet and you're like, yeah, like I still believe I'm born in England. I have like so much evidence for this, but like there's a small chance I'm wrong, you know? And so, so part of this might be like, like people have pushed back on me and be like, no, you just like don't believe anymore. That's like not a belief. Um, and I think part of it's just like a standoff on, yeah. I mean, it might be like a methodology thing partially, um, but to me it seems like you can perfectly say, I believe P, but there's a chance I'm wrong about P, right? Um, what does become Morian is when you say P, but there's a chance that not P. And the reason I think that's Morian is because I think when you assert P rather than just I believe P, you're not just indicating you believe P, you're indicating that you rely on your belief that P and reasoning. And I think you shouldn't rely on your belief that P and rely on your credence that P and reasoning at the same time. Um, you should only rely on one or the other. And so I think that's why P, but there's a chance that not P sounds Morian. But I believe P, but there's a chance that not P doesn't sound Morian. Because you're just acknowledging you have a belief, but that doesn't mean you rely on it. All right, that's really interesting. That's, okay, yeah, we can talk more. There's like so much that I didn't get to talk about that I'm like, so yeah, anyway, yeah, cool. <laughs> okay, we have seven minutes and seven people left. Okay, bye. <laughs> right here. Thank you. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that like, at some point you said that a, um, if somebody was, you, you could shoot a case where somebody has misleading evidence for a racist or mm -hmm. offensive belief, 
Mm -hmm. um, and that they, uh, that the belief is racist is a kind of moral reason not to believe it. But I was thinking mm -hmm. that that's not really, doesn't seem quite right because mm -hmm. that a belief is racist or sexist is, uh, would make the belief false because a sexist or racist belief is probably a prejudice and it's not responsive to evidence or, mm -hmm. I mean, that the way a lot of people think about racist and sexist beliefs is they're the kinds of beliefs that are false to begin with. So it's sure. actually an epistemic reason not to believe uh, that particular belief, that it's racist or sexist, if you're following. Yeah, I mean, it I guess. It might also be a moral reason. I'm not saying it's yeah. not, but it might also be uh, a rational epistemic reason. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a question of like, whether we can even have evidence for racist and sexist beliefs, but maybe you think like, Growing up in some communities and being in some frames of mind, you can have that evidence. And I agree, it's gonna be a false belief, it's gonna be misleading evidence, but you can't, I mean, this also depends on, again, your theory of epistemic justification. And um, one move to make against pragmatic encroachment is just to be like, no, these are never epistemically justified. So that might be part of what your question is getting at. I, I don't but, agree with, disagree so, with what you said, but I think yeah. the way that you construed it is that this person kind of has knowledge that it's racist or they have some evidence or Oh, definitely not knowledge. Well, <laughs> knowledge is factive, so not that, yeah. sense, At least there's some sensitivity to that it's racist or, or however you want to construe it, but there's oh. something feeding into their, their, oh. their sensitivity here. You know? So they have a belief and they know of that belief that it is racist. That's the way it seems to be written. Oh, interesting, okay. I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, so there's probably different ways you could spell out this case. You could have a belief and have a bunch of evidence for it and maybe like, in a, in a blameworthy way, be ignoring that evidence in such a, or being ignoring your higher order evidence in such a way that you don't know it's racist. Um, but yeah, maybe you could have a belief and just, and just know it's racist and not care, <laughs> I guess. And that seems, that seems very messed up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. motivations for moral encroachment that such beliefs exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I probably just, I need to think more about that. Um, again, like there's a lot of literature here that I haven't gotten the chance to get into as much, and I might want to write another paper on moral encroachment, kind of based on some comments from you guys and from Remo. So, um, so this is helpful to think through, like how would we, what analyses would we give of these different <coughs> cases of sexist or racist beliefs? So, yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, in one of uh, my papers, I rely on um, encroachment, but a different kind of encroachment that you that you discuss, than what you discuss here. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is describe the kind of encroachment that I rely on and see if you think that your account would undermine it. Okay. Um, I don't yeah. see how it would, but I could be wrong. Okay. So yeah. I'm thinking of a case where, uh, so I reject evidentialism so that, uh, as the idea that uh, you should base your belief on, on what evidence, you or a justified belief is based on the agent's current evidence. Because mm -hmm. I think in some cases, um, and I think your, your, your intuition in favor of this view is something I can accommodate. The one that you mentioned earlier, that the okay. that with the unicorn. So I think sometimes it's insufficient. It might be necessary, but insufficient. So if the agent's current, um, if the agent's current um, uh, evidence is the, the reason the agent has a, this evidence and not this much more evidence, if that's a product of deliberate failure or in a failure to inquire adequately, mm -hmm. then it isn't enough. Like the base having your Believe that your credence proportion to the evidence just isn't enough because you haven't done enough investigation. Uh huh. So, what? How much investigation is enough investigation? That might be practically practically entangled. So I yeah I have, yeah yeah. I so see. I, I have I have a number of cases, but yeah, I think we're no. running short on time. Huge question. Like evidence gathering norms, epistemic, practical, sometimes both. Like that's huge. Like I don't know if I have a strong view on that. I think there's like interesting reason to think they're often practical, but then you might push on that and say, well, can't you still like make an epistemic mistake and that kind of like, uh, 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 like that kind of derive from something dualism. practical? But you don't think your dual, the dualism that undermines the high stakes cases would necessarily say something about these cases? Yeah, that, I, yeah I, don't, I don't know what I think about those cases, like about evidence gathering. I, I, so I was thinking more about epistemic rationality being a relationship between some body of evidence and, and what you should believe or what credence we should have. And not necessarily, maybe there's a broader notion of epistemic rationality that also involves like when you should gather evidence and when you shouldn't and what kinds of evidence you should gather and that kind of thing. Um, and that there's pragmatic encroachment on that, I I'm, I'm, think I'm much more open to. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah.
Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, Stephanie. Yes. Yeah. Um, Annalise. So thank you so much for your talk. Yeah. I'm actually really sympathetic to the Druidism. Sort of oh, features. cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I had a question about your last bit about the difference between having a belief and relying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my worry is though that it seems really oddly familiar to this view that I saw that was actually in favor of pragmatic encroachment mm. between having a high credence in P and accepting P. So mm. to me, that seems like having and relying and relying mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. accepting were very closely attached. And this was also in a paper about physical organization. So you can put that aside whether you think that we should use statistical evidence and just think about whether mm -hmm. those high state cases about like racial profiling or things like that that we should have that difference. And the reason why in the, um, they thought it was a case for practical pragmatic encroachment was because then you can decide, well, sure, I have this like high credence, yeah. key, but I won't accept it. Yeah. The reason I don't accept it is because I do these like pragmatic things where it shows me the cost. Yeah. So my question exactly. to you, exactly. my worry is, how is this not pragmatic encroachment for you between having and relying? Because how do you get mm -hmm. to the relying bit without doing Okay. You know what I mean? In which do we not do a pragmatic <coughs> move in order to decide whether we rely? Oh, so, sorry, maybe I was unclear. So, I think whether you should rely on a bit like an attitude and reasoning, I think that's actually like very practical. Like, it might, there might be an epistemic input as well, but I think that is definitely affected by stakes. And, and that's kind of, I mean, that insight is sort of what I'm trying to say is actually going on in these bank cases, right? I'm trying to say in the high stakes case, um, because, this, because of the practical factors, they're affecting reliance. So the practical factors are affecting the fact that Hannah should not rely on her belief and reasoning in the high stakes case. But I think that's separable from questions about whether Hannah should just have the belief or Hannah should just have the credence. So we might be on the same page. I'm not, maybe I didn't fully. I, I felt like we got away from the purism. Oh, good. So, so, so I'm a purist about questions about whether you should have a belief or have a credence, right? That's what I'm a purist about. Mm -hmm. But I'm a pragmatist, and yeah, this is the part I went through like okay. super fast, so probably I should have timed myself better and not spent like 20 hours talking about paintbrushes. Um, but <laughs> but <laughs> I'm a purist about whether we should have an attitude like a belief or a credence. I'm a pragmatist about reliance. Does that help? Sorry yeah. if that wasn't clear. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's helpful clarification, so thanks. Okay. Apologies to the four people that we didn't get to, but we're out of time. Uh, let's thank Liz and also Thank you. <laughs>